Our next speaker this morning is Tom Kieselbach. Tom is an attorney at Cousineau, Waldhauser, and Kieselbach. He has practiced law for more than 35 years, primarily representing employers, self-insurers, and insurance companies. In addition, he worked for several years as an adjunct professor of law. This morning, you will learn how an attorney prepares their workers' compensation file in mounting a sound defense. You will also learn about the use of existing evidence, future evidence, and eyewitness and potential expert testimony to collaborate the client's storyline while maintaining a high standard of ethical responsibility. Please welcome Tom Kieselbach. Thank you, Chris. I'm with the law firm of Cousin O. Waldhausen and Kieselbach, and I have practiced a long time. I've... Uh, I'm over 40 years now in the area of work comp. I'm a defense attorney, and what I plan to do is take you from start to finish on a work comp case. I'm going to uh, weave ethical considerations into my presentation, and then I am going to uh, take you through as a problem solver. Because what we are on the defense is we problem solve. But the starting point is always ethics, and that would be the code of professional responsibility. The ends never justify the means. We don't cheat, we don't lie. Uh, I view the code of professional responsibility as a room, and we don't stray from that room. We don't open the door and go outside the code of professional responsibility. There are competing interests, no question about that because there is quite a bit of money that changes hands. Uh, money and obviously winning are competing interests. The priority system is very straightforward, whether you're a defense attorney or a claims attorney, number one is the code. Number two is representing the client to the best of your ability. And number three, it is a business, but we keep those priorities in place, one, two, and three. We don't switch those around. We don't, we don't uh, flip-flop those priorities. I have discussion points, the code, uh, problem solving. Within the concept of problem solving, I'm going to take you to a case from start to finish. I'm going to weave in solid skill set, good listener, timely and accurate recommendations, no surprises, and efficiency. So, let me move the PowerPoint here. We are problem solvers from start to finish. We're problem solving when we get the file, we're problem solving right through to the very end. So this is what we do. We identify issues, defenses, gather facts, present facts, and we prepare an action plan. And it is within the context of solving the client's problem that this case progresses from beginning uh, to end. When I get a file from the client, it now comes in electronically. It used to come in by messenger or by mail. The file can be 10 pages, it can be 3,000 pages. The file has to clear conflicts, and then I call the client to thank them for the file, and then I want to get their perspective on what they see and what they've done and what they want. And I do this even before I look at the file. What I do when I pick up a file is I look at what has been done, where the file has been, what could have been done, what should have been done, and at this point in time, what can still be done So where we are in the historical context, where we want to be, and then an action plan as to how we get there. I review the file personally. I do it the old-fashioned way. I have my pen, I have my yellow magic marker, and I have my 3M post-it note flags. And with a notepad, I take lots of notes. My paralegal does not review the file. An associate does not review the file and give me a summary. I want to know the nuances of that file. I want to know what is in there. I then call my client after I've had an opportunity to review the file, and it might take 10 minutes, it might take 30 minutes, but I give the client my verbal perspective. I then memorialize this in a letter to the client, which you can call an action plan, but what it is is it's a blueprint that anybody within my firm can pick up this file and look at that letter at that point in time and know 
what has occurred on that file from the beginning when I find to right now and where we think this case should be going. So what do I do in that letter? Well, I obviously provide the profile of the, of the injured worker, the age, uh, date of birth, wage, whatever information I have there, the mechanism, the mechanics of the claimed injury. Um, if there are multiple histories, I give those histories. I lay out as best I can the clinical findings um, so that there's a perspective, if there have been statements taken, any relevant information I put in there, I put it in a chronological order and in a logical order. Many of the files that I get are deficient. Uh, the, the, the person's life begins with the date of that injury. Very seldom do I get records that predate the claimed injury. Many times, it's uh, the contact with the employer is lacking. There may have been a contact with an HR person, but that might be it. You know, most of my work is self-insured. Uh, I will always contact the employer and get a better idea as to what we're dealing with the, with the uh, employee. But in any event, in my letter, that I send to the client with that initial review. I go through where the file's been, where it is now, the investigation that's needed. If there are witnesses, who should contact whom? If there are legal issues, those legal issues that I view to be significant, and seldom are there legal issues because work comp is fact-driven. I lay out a game plan and a timeline and the discovery that's needed, who's going to do what and when, what records need to be obtained, uh, and I, uh, a deposition is usually needed. That's a fantastic tool. Uh, IMEs, visiting the facility, making phone calls, gathering facts, and that's really the key. Sometimes I can even lay out exposure in that first letter. Many times I can't. But as the case progresses, more information is obtained. And I have to say this, there should be fewer surprises for the client, fewer surprises for me, because if you start off with a grounded blueprint, there should be fewer surprises. And I try to be as efficient as possible so I don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel each time. Because all I have to do is go back and look at that initial blueprint letter and that brings me up to speed as to where we are. I also like to contact the opposing counsel. And I have good rapport with most of the plaintiff's attorneys in the state. And we talk, we develop a dialogue, we open a dialogue. I want to know what are they looking for? What are their goals? And, um, and, and usually they'll share that with me. If contact is needed with the employer, and I would say 90 plus percent of the time it is, I want to find out more about this injured worker. I want to know who this person is and what they're all about. And that will require uh, delving below just the HR person it needs, I, I may need to get down to co-workers, leads, and et cetera. But I start at the top and then I, I move my way down. I need to know, are there red flags? I, I want to know, are there attendance issues? Are there performance issues? Is there an inconsistent pain behavior? Uh, the, the questions can be quite extensive. And I tell the folks with the employer that what I say has to be kept in confidence. They should not be coffee table talk. And that uh, uh, they should not be uh, gossiping in the plant about this. I always report back to my client. If reporting is very important. That's one of the discussion points. Timely and accurate recommendations. Timely and accurate reporting. So the client knows what is going on. I have a paralegal who will gather records, medical records, dolly records, criminal records, employment records, and she will look at those records when they come in and she'll say, Tom, here's another provider that we were not aware of, and we'll go get those records. Uh, we do what needs to be done to gather evidence and to gather facts. Uh, discovery, uh, we have discovery in Minnesota. Many states do not. In Wisconsin, it's trial by ambush. Depositions are not allowed in, de in, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, the plaintiff's attorneys will frequently keep you in the dark. And at the same time, defense lawyers will keep the plaintiff's lawyers uh, in the dark. Uh, discovery, we have very simple statutory discovery. There are a handful of questions that we pose to defense with the plaintiff's counsel, and they respond. I get authorizations, uh, and, if, and most of the plaintiff's lawyers will share information. Uh, some do not. Sometimes we have to file a motion to compel. A deposition is a critical tool. 
I'm a dinosaur, even though I've been practicing over 40 years in this area, I still take many of my depositions, uh, especially if it's a case that I think is going to be tried. A good deposition can win a case for the defense, a bad deposition, you will lose a case. And there's no question about that. Believe it or not, my opening statement and my cross-examination of the witness is shaped by my deposition testimony. A deposition is a key tool. We gather facts. Uh, a deposition, a good deposition taker has to be able to listen, has to be a good listener. That's one of my discussion points. You want to listen to what the answer is and, and stay in a reality because sometimes the witness does not answer the question. Sometimes you may hear what you want to hear, but you have to focus your attention on listening. It's listening and asking questions, and that's an art form. And questions have to be short and simple and to the point. You never want a question that is longer than about three or four lines. Sometimes we ask leading questions. Sometimes I ask open-ended questions. It depends upon my goals because every deposition has a series of goals. Obviously gathering facts, that's important. Pinning down a story is important. Creating, if there are, credibility issues. I will give the lying witness lots of rope to hang himself. And they'll think I'm the dumbest person out there and I'll just let them go and go and go. Depends on what I'm looking for. If it's a multi-party case, I may very well use the testimony from leading to pin liability on another carrier. It really depends, but credibility sets up my cross, the, the deposition, especially credibility type questions, set up my cross-examination uh, at the hearing. I will get into extreme detail on where they've lived, addresses, who they've lived with, if there have been multiple spouses, names of spouses, the names now, where they live, I want to know where they've worked, the locations, and obviously you ask basically whether you had any prior, if you had have any injuries there, and et cetera, et cetera. But in any event, uh, my test questions are very detailed. I don't go off of a typewritten boilerplate questionnaire. Every deposition is a little different. There's some similarities, but every deposition is a little different. Uh, there will usually be an IME. Now we have 120 days from the date of the filing of the claim petition to submit our independent medical examination. Um, most plaintiff's counsels are, are very good at, at allowing for extensions. I like to take my deposition when I've had an opportunity to gather as much information and facts as I can, because facts are golden. I am very selective on who I use for my IMEs, for my depositions. If it's a Gillette claim, I frequently will take my doctor's deposition because I need to make certain that there's proper foundation for the doctor's testimony. So I want a doctor who is a good witness, who will give when he or she needs to give and will stand their ground when they should stand their ground. So I am very selective. Uh, throughout the process, there should be no surprises. And I say that because it's very important. It's a cardinal sin if a week before the hearing, the attorney calls up and says, oh, I just found out. And I told you we had an 80% chance of winning. Now we have an 80% chance of losing. That is a cardinal sin. That tells me that perhaps that defense attorney had other people doing work on the file and had eyeballs on the file and not that attorney. Now there are times that there are surprises. There are times when out of the blue, there's a surgical recommendation that comes in, but then we have to adjust that to. There are times when perhaps witness flip-flops, and there are times when perhaps a new witness comes into play that can change the facts. But absent that, there should be very few, there should be very few uh, uh, surprises. We have uh, mediations. And quite frankly, mediations are very, very popular these days, much more popular. Well, they're only a recent vintage, I'd say, in the last 10, 15 years. Um, when I first started practicing, we couldn't even settle temporary total or temporary partial out with certain judges. Judge Otto would 
they would not approve a settlement if it closed out indemnity on an admitted claim. In fact, we couldn't close out medical. That's all of a recent vintage of the last 15 years. But uh, the carriers, my clients, want closed files. Uh, they understand that uh, that the longer a claim goes on, the more difficult it gets, the harder it is to get a person back to work. They, they understand the red flags that Dr. Gelfman talked about. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers these days frequently want to settle cases also, so they will do settle. Dolly has some fantastic mediators, uh, absolutely fantastic. They do a wonderful job, and we have fantastic private mediators also. We also have settlement conference at OAH, at OAH and sometimes we can settle cases at OAH. By the time this case, by the time the deposition is taken, by the time we have conducted additional discovery after the deposition, we know more and more about the case. And usually after that deposition, I'm able to give a fairly accurate estimate of the exposure on the case and our relative chances of prevailing. Because by then we have our judge assignments and we know our judge. The judges are block assigned. We have a right to one strike. And uh, otherwise that judge is on that case for the life of the case. Prior to COVID, uh, we had hearings in person. Since COVID, we had telephonic hearings, video hearings, and now we have some limited live hearings. I have a hearing on Friday. It will be live. It will be my first live hearing uh, since COVID. Um, I've tried a ton of cases, a lot of cases, but uh, I try very few these days in comparison to what I, what my caseload was like 20 years ago. And again, it's because my clients want closed files, and that's their goal. From the beginning, they say we want a closed file. And so that's what we're working towards. And so uh, it seems like the cases that we try are those that we cannot settle. And that basically the ball is in the plaintiff's court and they say, nope, we're not going to settle. So we try those cases. Uh, we have three different types of cases. We have occupational disease cases. And I don't get involved with asbestos cases very often. Those are usually with the junior associates. That's the reality. Uh, we have Gillette cases, which are repetitive trauma cases. And we have the specific point trauma cases. Cases will be referred to me at the front end if there's a denial of liability, or it can be referred to me perhaps a year, two, or three after the day of injury, because somebody along the way flagged it and said, this case shouldn't be open, it's open too long. What is going on? What can we do? If it's a Gillette case, frequently my doctor will testify because we need proper foundation. And many times on these Gillette claims, many times, look, there are many times there are multiple histories as to the job as to the weights, the bending, the twisting, the standing, the lifting, et cetera, et cetera. In Gillette cases, I will frequently get an ergonomic assessment, and that's very helpful in, in, in analyzing uh, the nature of the job. But on a Gillette claim, I will frequently pick a doctor who I know is a good witness because I need to make certain that there is proper, uh, that there is proper foundation. Uh, we do not play hide and seek in Minnesota, unlike other states. Uh, we have pretrial statements where we have to share our witnesses, our exhibits, public outside what we're going to be submitting, and our, and our witnesses. So witnesses, exhibits, and issues. We have pretrial conferences so the judges can get a better handle on the case. Sometimes we have motions uh, to suppress evidence or to, for one reason or another, and there will be conferences with the judge where we can argue our, our motions. We have uh, hearings. In the past, um, uh, we could have a hearing that would last a whole day. Today, the hearings are much shorter. If we need more time, the courts will, OAH will, will grant the additional time. We bring our exhibits to the hearing. They're already marked. And then we offer our exhibits. The plaintiff has the burden of going forward with the evidence and the burden of proof. And those are two very important concepts. So the plaintiff, the employee, will present his or her exhibits. I might object to one or two. The judge will rule on those exhibits and then will uh, admit into evidence the exhibits that can be admitted into evidence. I then offer my exhibits, and there may be some objections to my exhibits as well. And the judge will admit those exhibits. The, the, we do not follow the rules of evidence per se, but our judges generally do. Competent evidence is what is admitted. That's very broad. 
but you better know your rules of evidence if you're going to be, say, offering into evidence a learned treatise. Uh, if you're going to be asking for evidence to be suppressed, you better know your rules of evidence. If it's a spouse and you want to uh, allege spousal immunity, you better know your rules of evidence. Our judges are very bright. Um, they, have, they are specialists and they have experience. Unlike some states where there are judges who really don't have any experience at all and come over from unemployment, our judges all have experience in top, practiced on the defense side or plaintiff side, and they have experience. Opening statements are huge weapons. This is where uh, a roadmap is presented. And uh, this is where I tell the court, this is what I'm gonna do. These are the facts that I'm going to lay out for you. This is what I will present to you. I like to weave in a little argument and some conclusions, but not enough to be objectionable. So this is where I tell the court that this is what I'm going to show. Uh, I'll give you a little introduction as to how I might present the opening statement that I will give if there are foundational issues with the expert, the plaintiff's expert. I will start off by saying thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate the opportunity to make this opening statement. My name is Tom Kieselbach. I represent the employer and insurer, and I'm going to skip the name of the employer and insurer. It is respectfully submitted, Your Honor, that the employee's claim will fail. Mrs. Smith's claim will fail because she will fail to meet her burden of proof. The claim will fail because there is a lack of foundation for Dr. Jones' opinion. In fact, when you look at the foundation, there is utter and complete lack of foundation. In this case, Your Honor, which is a Gillette claim, only one doctor testified. Only one doctor has proper foundation for his opinion. And that is the independent medical examiner, Dr. Ben Case of television fame. He is the only doctor who had proper foundation for his testimony. Now, what are the facts and what will we show? And at that point, I will weave in my facts. And again, my cross-examination of the employee leads and my opening statement, and then I weave in direct from my witnesses and my doctor. If there are credibility issues, I will also at the very beginning indicate, and Your Honor, furthermore, there are significant credibility issues in this case. The employee has provided misinformation for not only one doctor, Two doctors but three doctors and she will be cross-examined on those points and your honor we will further point out credibility issues through cross-examination regarding sworn deposition testimony where there was misinformation your honor we might even conclude that she lied on not only one occasion but two three four occasions now if i tell the court that there are four credibility points based on the deposition I better show that. And the same with the direct testimony, uh, same with the cross off of records. Cross examination of the employee is an art form and it requires a skill set and it's a learned skill set. I was very fortunate to learn cross examination from Bob McGuire and Craig Anderson, who were phenomenal trial attorneys. They practiced in comp, but they were primarily civil trial lawyers. A good cross-examiner is gentle and has gentle control, and you need control of the witness. I cross-examine off of inconsistent statements. I cross-examine off of depositions. The cardinal rule is that I only ask questions if I know the answer to that question, and I can reinforce that. So if they say, no, that's not true, I can then throw back at them that this is, this is what they did say at a prior point in time or I have a lay witness who will come in and contradict that particular testimony. The cross-examination tells the story. And as I indicated, a defense wins cases on cross and credibility, and they lose cases with weak cross. Closing is argument. That's a point in time in which I will tell the court that on direct I laid out the facts that I told you I would present at this hearing, and I did. Every fact that I laid out in my opening statement 
I present it. And then I present my argument. And again, this is something that you don't do on the fly. This is something that a, a, an attorney with a skill set will work on and will have that closing argument ready to go. Sometimes facts change at the hearing, so sometimes that closing has to change. Now, I mentioned at the beginning the discussion points. Solid skill set takes that defense lawyer from beginning to end. A good listener, that's required at the hearing, it's required at a deposition, it's required should the case proceed beyond the hearing and to the work comp court of appeals. A good oral presentation is practiced, it requires effort, it's not spur of the moment, but it requires good listening because you have to be able to shift gears. So the appellate process goes after the judge issues the findings and order, there's a right to an appeal to the Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals. After that, there is a potential for a petition for writ of certiorari at our Minnesota Supreme Court. Keep in mind that most of these cases are fact-oriented. Most of the findings and orders are factual in basis. Our Court of Appeals will look at uh, if it's a factual issue, what, is there substantial evidence to support the judge's findings or is there clear error? Occasionally lawyers are trying to be, they try to be clever and they think they can create a legal issue but seldom are there legal issues. So that is, is, is where we are, that is what I do. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Um, Mr. Kieselbach, we have two questions. One is, why has the recent defense focus moved to be so anti-QRC? I don't know if it is. I would say this, if, if you think that you're being picked on, maybe you need to look at yourself and say, am I getting the job done? I see QRCs that really do a great job. And I see QRCs that you need to push, you need to push them along. Um, but uh, I don't have an anti-QRC uh, position. Uh, I would say that may be similar to adjusters who say, oh, on the defense, we never win a case. And I just say, well, that's not true. The case is presented properly, you can win a case. You have to pick those cases that you, that you try. Um, I would always say, if somebody feels that they're being picked on, and I say this to my associates, if you think that a lawyer has picked on you, what did you do? Sometimes it's the other attorney, but take a look at yourself. Um, I always try to be um, uh, polite and courteous to the QRC, and I always try to work with the QRC. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you an answer to that. You have to basically look at the individual case, look at the attorneys. The attorney may be posturing for the uh, adjuster, that's possible. Okay, the other question we did receive in was, um, how has COVID-19 impacted your work and your ability to reach resolution on, on these matters? Well, it, it has. Um, for a time period there, it was, uh, well, we're, we're still doing our depositions by Zoom. And I, I like depositions in person. I like being able to pin a witness down with documents that I don't disclose before the deposition. So I can say, here it is, especially if I need to create a story or a narrative. This is not for cross purposes. This is so, if I say if I want to create a new injury, or you no, know, put liability on a prior injury. I like having the witness there. That has impacted. Um, COVID has slowed down treatment. I mean, there's no question about that. It's slowed down the resolution of these cases, simply because patients were not going to the doctors as frequently. Um, the, the hearings, uh, I, I like hearings in person. I really do. I like being able to approach a witness. I like if I'm crossing off of a, a deposition, I like to say, uh, Mr. Smith, do you recall your deposition was taken on April 1, 2019, yes. And at that time, you raised your hand to tell the truth. And you did, that's correct. And did you tell the truth at that deposition? Yes, I did. 
Your Honor, may I approach the witness? And then I approach the witness and I say, I'm showing you what, I'm showing you page 52, lines one through five. And then I ask the question and the answer is, and your answer was no, that I correct the quote. And I have just impeached off of a previous inconsistent statement. And they have, I have total, complete, gentle control. You can't do that with a video, but you can do that in person. And so it has, it has helped the plaintiff's bar with those that know how to cross off with credibility issues. Uh, but um, as I say, that's kind of how it's done. Um, so let me, yeah, let me wait two more questions, but I'll ask you to be very quick on these if you could. Um, but I do, because I want to stay on timely. The first one is, could you define, earlier you had said, what is meant, or you had said, a good versus bad QRC. What do you mean by a good versus a bad QR QRC? Well, I don't know if it's a good or bad, and I'm sorry if I use those terms. Um, I think a QRC should not be closely affiliated with uh, a plaintiff's firm or a defense firm. They need to be independent. And, um, and I do hear uh, plaintiff's lawyers saying, just like you used to say, I have my stable of QRCs, I have my stable, I mean, stable of chiropractors, I have my stable of QRCs. They should always remain independent from that plaintiff's counsel. Um, the, the job is to get the job done and to represent that and to, to help that injured worker through this very difficult system and to communicate with the, um, with the adjuster and to, to, to communicate well. I think that's important. So, um, and uh, to, to work with the employer, work with the key, work with the employee. In other words, be well-rounded. And that's really what is, what I view as an effective QRC versus a less effective QRC. Um, I think encouraging people to remain positive, injured workers to remain positive, and they don't get down on the system, being honest with with, with all the players, that's, that's very important. Um, and um, and that's pretty much the way it should be. Uh, you know, the, the code of professional responsibility applies to, to attorneys, and I think that the uh, that, that the um, that the ethics code applies to the uh, that the QRCs that should be, be followed to. But that's basically it. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Kieselbach, for your presentation. Very informative and and. I appreciate you answering all the questions that have been posed. Well, and have a wonderful day, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you.